God is a mighty God and he has got an answer for whatever question you have today. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. We've got a great show for you today and this is Hope Today. I'm Tom, this is Anna. And Anna, we've got some great guests coming up. Yes, I'm so excited for our guests. Well, did you know that nearly 1,300 new Steph families are formed every day? Well, blended families represent 40% of all families. And in just a few minutes, we'll talk with authors Timothy and Olivia Smith about their blended family journey. They'll also share practical tips, wisdom, and encouragement for all of us step parents so that we, along with our children, can thrive in our beautifully blended homes. So, Tom, I just, w with my husband, we formed a new step family yeah, back yeah, in February. Right. And so, this is going to be a good conversation. It's such an important topic. It's mm -hmm. so important. And in fact, we're, we're, we've got other important topics today, too, because right. we've got a jam packed show for you. But Rick Klein will be with us. And uh, he, you know, I have to, uh, let me say it this way. I worked with truck drivers and warehouse guys for a long time in my life, and they ask questions sometimes that you think a professor at, uh, at, at an Ivy League school would ask. I mean, yeah. about Christianity. You're trying to share your faith. You're trying to just do something to prompt some, uh, some response in them that would uh, be favorable towards Christianity. And they'll say things like, well, 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 how do we know the Bible is true? And how do we know God exists? And, 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 and so this is real practical stuff that Rick is going to be sharing with us about how we can have those discussions, how we can ask questions and listen and know how to respond. It's going to be a powerful time, important for every one of us. It's not something dusty in an ivory tower at some university. It's real life right where we live. That's that's coming up in the second half of the show. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we all know that the Olympics started this yes. weekend, <laughs> and there is there's good talk. There's quite the controversial talk, and most of you likely have heard about the opening ceremonies and the display of the Last Supper um, that was highly offensive to Christianity. There's a global outrage, and we just wanted to talk about that for a minute. Yeah, just, you know, it, it's, it is interesting that, uh, you know, uh, it's funny, I saw one of the, the models or whatever they are that were participating in that display say, hey, well, it wouldn't be very interesting if no one was offended. And, and you kind of get that, Anna, you get that kind of attitude from people, well, we just need to offend Christianity, you know, we need to, and it obviously was a, an offensive thing and the, the French Catholic Church spoke out against it and, and uh, religious leaders and, and civic leaders worldwide right. have said, why did we really need to do that, you yeah. know? Yeah, so many are talking about it and I keep going back to this scripture that just says that God will not be mocked, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, as Christians, we were disrespected, we're offended, but when they outrightly mock God, I mean, the Bible talks about how God will not be mocked. He won't be mocked, but he still loves them. He's and he still yes. wants to, 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 to save them and to see them come. When we have a powerful faith, when we have a strong faith in Christianity, it will be mocked at times. And, right. uh, you know, some people are boycotting the Olympics and won't watch. Mm -hmm. The athletes didn't have anything to do with that. So I will, I will still watch. But, yeah. yeah, it was important for us to bring that up. Right. Yeah. And I think that it's important for us to just continue to pray for all, uh, every person around the world that does not know Christ, that we fully come to have a revival that everybody will turn to the Lord and Absolutely. his grace is there for them. Absolutely. So, all right, well, let's jump in with our first guests and our conversation about step families. Tim and Olivia Smith have been married for nearly 27 years and share six children. Well, Tim leads a ministry called Blended Not Broken, which exists to support blended families. Olivia knows what it is to be a stepchild as well as a step parent. Statistics say that nearly 1,300 new step families are formed every day, making up 40% of all families. We're excited for Tim and Olivia to join us now. So welcome to Hope Today. Thank you. It's Thank great you. to be with you guys. So six children, 27 years. Tell us a little bit about your blended family journey. Well, um, about uh, 27, a little over 27 years ago, I ended up on this girl's uh, uh, front porch, uh, knocking on her door uh, through a blind date. And a few short months later, we decided to do 
the what today seems like the wildest adventure of our lives, and that is to blend uh, family with uh, six kids. So Olivia had three children. I had three children. Uh, one of my friends at our wedding actually uh, uh, stepped up to the piano and played the Brady Bunch theme as we uh, walked up the aisle, and uh, I'll never forgive him for that. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it was... Uh, uh, that's how it all began. And we've had this uh, terrific journey of, uh, you know, of, of marriage and uh, also the, the beauty of a, of a blended family as well. What are some of the biggest challenges that step families face? Um, well, I, as I said before, we lead a blended family group and we have found that these topics come up the most. And so some of the topics are it, um, keeping your marriage a priority. Uh, it's very easy for the kids to come in and uh, pull at you and all of the needs that come with a blended family. So um, making it a point to keeping your marriage strong and a priority. Um, how to resolve conflict, that's another struggle. Um, there is, uh, you tend to be loyal to your children when conflict comes up and, and so you're defending them and your husband's defending them and it's, it's trying to find a healthy way to resolve that and move forward. Right. The other one is uh, co-parenting with your ex, uh, always a struggle. Um, we found in the, for us in the beginning it's just an adjustment. But there are things you can do and you can learn to find that path that makes it a smoother transition. It's so beneficial for the kids. I think one of the things that I found down the road is um, as you heal after divorce, that it really is about the kids. And you learn to put those differences you know, aside and work together to find the best way for your children. And um, we hope to help people find that way to do that. And the other is who disciplines? You know, it's, uh, we have learned, especially in the beginning, um, developing that relationship with your children, uh, with your, uh, with the uh, uh, blended children. It's so important to do that. But when it comes to um, the disciplines, we found the, um, the parent, uh, of the kids is the best one to do that. Um, later down the road when you've got a relationship, it becomes a little bit easier to say, you need to do this or you need to do that. In the beginning, um, I disciplined my children and Tim disciplined his. Mm -hmm. And so I've heard that, it, that one of the biggest challenges, and I think you even mentioned, is the, the bonding of the stepchild with the step parent. So when they're for working on uh, forming that relationship, what are some tips that you have? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a great question. You know, I think it's first off that the, the best uh, advice I can give is be patient mm -hmm. because it is a very long process in that bonding experience. And I have a terrific relationship uh, with Olivia's children. Um, her youngest uh, lived in the home uh, full time with us, and it didn't start as as great as as great as it is today. It didn't start there, and it took a lot of uh, of kind of weighing in on hard topics and uh, why things are different uh, at our house versus uh, his dad's house not trying to be his dad, but to really understand my role as his stepdad and just, uh, um, just giving it, giving time and giving the child time to lean in to this new, uh, this new relationship. You know, they didn't ask for this. Uh, the kids didn't show up in our, to us and say, Hey, why don't you guys get married and disrupt our lives? <laughs> you know, um, but that's what happened. Their lives were very disrupted and as, as we came together. And so it was, uh, it's just a process and just a, a, a patient, you know, kind of plotting process is the best, best advice I could give. Yeah, that's good stuff. It's so good to acknowledge what the, the child is experiencing and to hear them, to work to understand them and be able to connect that way. 
So husband and wife, uh, how do you work on keeping your marriage strong when it seems like the kids are working to divide? Gotta be a priority uh, for us. Um, Tim was very involved with his kids and sports and, and uh, it was one of the things I loved the most when I met Tim was his relationship with his children. He is an amazing father. But later on, that became a challenge for me because he spent so much time with them that I found myself struggling with that. Um, so you really do um, have to sit down and have these conversations about um, let's go away for a weekend or let's have a date night. Um, setting healthy boundaries in your marriages, you know, and uh, not letting the kids feel neglected, but also finding that place for both of you where you feel like you're giving each other the time and you're hearing each other's needs and you're keeping each other that priority. It's work. Um, we found that with our blended families that with all the kids and the activities, they were like, we have no time for each other. So that's when you say you make time. You've got to find that because if your marriage doesn't make it, your kids, the families, you're just not going to make it. Uh, let me ask you something, uh, Tim and Olivia. What about the other spouse, the previous spouse and the relationship? And it's a lot of ragged edges there and not very good feelings and wrong things being said. How do you stay above board with all that yourself? And how, how do you not, you know, kind of dive in when you're falsely accused or whatever? Those are, there's always ragged edges with the, those types of relationships. Oh man, uh, for sure. Co-parenting is, I think, the backbone to a really healthy uh, blended family. And first, uh, first off, it, it requires everybody to be willing to participate. And, and it's not always the case. Now, in our situation, uh, our relationship with Olivia's ex-husband and his wife is very strong, and it's uh, and for the most part, it's been strong throughout our, our our marriage. I think there's always those initial experiences, you know, where you uh, you wonder what they're saying when they have the kids, and they're wondering what we're saying when we have the kids. But we we're, we're way past that now. And and on the on the flip side, my ex-wife is a non-participant in co-parenting. And so, uh, you know, we have two different scenarios and if you can't get the participation, then, you know, you just, you can't fight that. You just have to press on and be the best parent that you can be. But uh, the, the positive things that we've seen uh, with uh, our strong co-parenting relationship with Olivia's ex-husband and, and his wife has I feel has been a real strength to our ability to to blend Olivia's three children into a life with me. So it's interesting how you talk about the the challenges to to keep a marriage strong with all the other things that are pulling against it and statistics for divorce for second marriages are as high as 60 to 70%. Uh, how does your faith change? Like I've heard that having Christ at the center can very much impact and strengthen the marriage. What, what would you say to that? It's key. It is absolutely the key. I think in the beginning for Tim and I, we were so madly in love. I've been a single mom for 10 years. And when we met, we were so madly in love and life was wonderful. And, but we, you know, the thing that we shared, you know, the most, the, the most important thing was our values and our relationship with God. And then we dive into this blended family with all the struggles that comes with. And I said over and over, we both said, um, if we didn't have God, we couldn't get, we couldn't make it through. Yeah. Prayer was such a huge focus for me uh, every day. I mean, and I didn't have resources. God was my resource. So when I struggled, I went to the word and I went to prayer and I learned to pray for his kids and our marriage. And it really was the foundation. And we try to encourage blended families, keep 
your relationship with God first. Yeah. And that's what, it was the glue for us. It was definitely the glue. Yeah, so well said. Thank you for that, Olivia. So in the last minute that we have then, Olivia, would you be willing to pray for step families? Sure, love to. Father, thank you for this opportunity um, to share how amazing you are and how much you care for the blended family. Lord, you made the difference in our marriage, and I know that you can make the difference in all of those listening to us. I thank you, too, Father, for the opportunity that we have in uh, being um, a stepmom or a stepdad to these new families and the ways that you want to use us. I pray for these families, God, strengthen us and equip us with everything that we need to be uh, godly parents, um, and that we can move forward on this journey, on this adventure with our blended families. Lord, show each show the parents that it's a privilege and an honor to be chosen to be a step parent, and the difference that we can make in our children. I ask your blessing upon them. I pray they find resources. I pray that they stay strong in you and keep their marriage strong in you. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunities that you give us to love others. And we invite you to be the glue that holds these marriages together. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we do want to make sure that we mention the resource that you both have. It's a 100-day devotional for step parents called Blending. And I can say that my husband and I will be going through this. So just thank you so much for your ministry and the ways that both of you are supporting blended families. Thank you so much for being with us, Tim and Olivia. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, wonderful discussion, an important one. After the break, we're going to come back with Rick Klein, and he's going to give us some answers to some tough questions, and also help us to be the light to our friends and family. We'll be right back. The barriers that stand between you and a blessed life may feel insurmountable, but Dr. Robert Jeffers assures you they can be overcome. This month, when you give your most generous gift to Cornerstone Television, we'll send you Dr. Jeffers' new book, Invincible, Conquering the Mountains That Separate You from the Blessed Life. Offering biblical insight and practical tools, he explains how you can conquer the hindrances of doubt, guilt, anxiety, discouragement, fear, and bitterness through prayer and faith in a God whose strength can move mountains. Request your copy when you support the gospel ministry of Cornerstone Television. Your generosity will evangelize the lost, encourage believers, provide excellent Bible teaching, and so much more. Call us today and become invincible, conquering the mountains that separate you from the blessed life. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for giving. Well, discussing our Christian faith with family and friends can be quite challenging. I'm sure you've experienced that. But that is unless you know what questions to ask and how to properly respond. Ordained minister and author Rick Klein is our next guest. Rick spent 45 years in ministry, training for ministry, in ministry, as well as 20 of those years as a law enforcement officer and detective. He joins us now to offer insights on how we can share our faith with anyone without being confrontational. Rick, welcome to Hope Today. Thank you. Glad to so be you here. were a detective. Yes, in Southern California in a police department. Okay. Well, then you are used to asking a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about that. We live in a confrontational age, okay? We just do. You know, we're gearing up for the political season, and it's all controversy. Twitter's all controversy, everything. We talked about controversy with the Olympics at the beginning. How do we begin conversations about faith in Jesus Christ without descending into that confrontational attitude? The first thing, response, is to find some common ground that you can agree with the person and then get permission to ask a question and ask a question. So for example, if someone says that they uh, don't believe in God at all, it's superstitious. 
you could begin by agreeing. Well, there are a lot of superstitious religions. And but can I ask you a question? Is there anything that you might believe that doesn't have any real direct evidence? Like you might believe in gravity, but you can't see it. Yeah. So is it unreasonable to believe in something that you can't actually see? And so really you want to be able to start off by being at that level with them as a friend. Mm -hmm. And you do that without trying to defend your view right off the bat. Well, that's interesting because we can all get our hackles up a little bit and we want to just dive in to defend ourselves and what we believe instead of like having, taking that, uh, maybe making that bridge approach to someone. We, we, we want to, maybe I need to ask you this to kind of, we, the, your book is called Sorting Through Worldviews, How to Give Reasonable Responses in Defense of Christianity. And right there, some people might say, well, what's a worldview? Why do I actually have, does everyone have a worldview? Overarching idea of a worldview is an opinion on how you approach life. And so, for example, a, an atheist views, views life as just material, no spirit, no divine being. A Hindu has a completely different idea of how to approach life. And so every person has an overarching view. So a Christian uh, approaches life uh, through the lens of the Bible. And so we want to be able to see that when we're talking to someone that they do have a worldview, what it is, and then from there begin to ask them questions about what they think and then ask permission to say, well, let me ask you this and then go on with some questions. So really, if you're confronted with a worldview, an opinion that is contrary to Christianity, you don't have to have an answer immediately. You give yourself time to think and ask them about what their view is and why they hold it, because you can't really give them an answer if you don't really know their objection. And it's very easy to do, it's calm, and you're not, defending your view right off the bat and giving them an argument. Mm -hmm. Do you have tips and wisdom to share with folks as we are navigating on social media, the political season, the things that are happening with the Olympics, and we're seeing this, the two different views clashing. How would you, what kind of encouragement tips would you give to Christians on social media? On social media, it's probably one of the worst means by which you can present your Christian worldview because you don't have enough space, time, words to really uh, set it out. It's probably better not to argue it. That's my personal opinion. And if someone really has a hostile view, you might simply respond two or three hours later and pose a question and let that person think about it. And you can give your worldview as a Christian by forming a question, let them think. And then maybe you can have a dialogue. It doesn't always work peacefully, however, because people are hostile. That's just the way it is. Uh, well, let's, let's dive into a couple objections to Christianity or the Christian worldview that we might hear pretty often. One is, okay, you say God is good, all this bad stuff is happening. I have heard people that have deconstructed their faith. That's the reason they give many times. All this bad stuff is happening, but we say God is good. How do we square those two? Or how would we approach that with someone who said that objection to us? Well, this is the basic problem of evil, it's called. And the assumption is, is that if there's a good God, then he would not allow evil. So in friends that I've talked to, when they make this objection, uh, I will ask them, do you believe that if there is a God, that he would stop everything he doesn't like because God would not like evil? And they agree. I say, well, what if God saw some of the things that you did that he didn't like? What, how would you feel if he stopped you from doing it? Wouldn't you eventually think that he was some sort of cosmic meddler and maybe he should just leave you alone. How would you like that? Well, I wouldn't like it at all. Well, God allows us the options to pick how we want to live our lives morally. 
And God only has made the possibility of evil, but he has not actualized it. He's given us the moral free will. And so it doesn't impugn God's power nor his moral nature to, to allow us the choice of doing evil. And God then could use that to bring about something good, even though God didn't actually cause it. I like that answer. And, and again, we can share it in a way that's non-confrontational, that is taking a strong stand. And this is the key, uh, I think, of your book, is asking questions, engaging in conversation. That seems to be the key, knowing, if, knowing certainly what you believe, but trusting that as you converse with the people, you begin to see openness. Yes, and you want to have a goal in mind on, on whatever the conversation is or what you want to lead the person to agree with. And so you really have to think ahead a little bit on how you would answer various objections. So my book gives many examples of conversations I've had with people, their objections, and some ways to answer it. And it, it's not all the answers, of course. <laughs> But it does prompt the average Christian in church to be able to uh, look at issues and think through them and yeah. give some tools. Yes, in fact, let me mention that again. Uh, sorting through world views, how to give reasonable responses in defense of Christianity, author Rick Klein. Rick, thank you so much. There's a million more hours we could spend talking about yes. this. People need to get the book and uh, just begin to think about those things. Thank you so thank much you. for being with us today. Yes, thank absolutely. You. Well, we're so thankful for the conversations that come out of hope today. We are set on putting hope out into this world where there's always a battle for that, that light will prevail, that the darkness will not overcome it. And we're so thankful for you, our CTVN family that, that tunes in, that watches, that, that you are the ones that are lifting up the name of Jesus. Do not be silent, do not be afraid. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. He wants to use you in such a mighty way to share his love with all the earth. Thanks so much for being with us. On tomorrow's Hope Today, be encouraged to share your faith in everyday conversation. Respected author and award-winning singer Babby Mason explores Matthew 5:16 in her mission to lift the light of the gospel higher than ever before. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.